Yeah. I mean, I truly, truly believe that an happy team makes a better work. Welcome to the Naked Texture Artist. On this podcast, I have deep and honest conversations with visual effects and animation veterans about their challenges and growth as working artists. My name is Mark Pierre Sondergaard, and I'll be your host. Let's get started. Oh boy, I love this part of my interview with Claudia Mavisi. These are the juicy bits. In this episode, we're settling deeper into Claudia's daily life as an artist and head of texturing. We talk about how we can trip up as artists, what Claudia's greatest challenges are right now, and what are the things that have an outsized effect on team morale. We also talk about assets that can break us, and how do you keep up your energy levels so that you can set a good example for your team? We delve into Claudia's superpower and where she must compensate for her weaknesses. Lots of practical tips for artists of all stripes and levels of seniority. And of course, we have to geek out on assets we wished we had done. This is stuff all of us deal with in some fashion. And here you're able to learn from the experiences of the texture supervisor of Pixamondo. So let's get to it. Let's talk about your day to day. So you're now, you've worked for a long time, so long that you stopped counting the years as a professional artist. What have you learned over these years? Do you have any, what should we say, little mind tricks, like the Jedi mind trick when Obi-Wan Kenobi is telling, telling them these are not the droids you're looking for? Like some, some kind of, some little hack, some little, how do you get through, like, I don't know, do you ever feel like you have a creative block where you're just sitting there looking at the asset and it's just nothing is coming out, like squeezing water out of a stone. There's just nothing there. Do you have any workarounds that sort of help you through your day like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, it's not that I have the magic word because that would be nice to just share it with anyone and that, like, you know, done. But, I mean, creative block is something that I think happens to all of us. And it's actually a horrible feeling when it happens because it's like, especially at the beginning, I remember when I started and you had this and I said, I was, and you were, I was freaking out thinking, oh my God, it's like I have dailies like tomorrow and I have nothing. Yeah. I cannot pass yeah. this. And it's like you, you are so into your head uh, that you, you, you just cannot get unstuck in a way. Yeah. I mean, first of all, when this happens, don't panic. Chuck Jones, the creator of Bugs Bunny and many other Looney Tunes characters, dismissively said, Inspiration is for amateurs. And yes, as amateurs, we can so choose to only practice our craft when everything is just right. As professional artists, we don't have that luxury. Whatever you feel like, however your day is going, you need to put out the goods. A byproduct of that is panic. Yeah, panic is real. As artists, what we do is so often tied to our emotions. So our work can be a direct connection to some of our strongest feelings, including fear, very real, very visceral fear. I think I mentioned that my first gig in the industry was as a runner at the short-lived digital domain studio in London. There, I spent month after month running errands, taking out the trash, making coffee and tea, and doing whatever else nobody else wanted to do. Old building with bad plumbing, so our toilets would block up constantly. I think you get the idea. Being a runner was not glamorous work. But you hoped there would be a payoff at the end of that dark tunnel. You were, of course, hoping and dreaming and praying that one day they will let you near some actual texture work. One day after a long day of work, just before closing time, I was approached to do some actual texture work. I was asked to produce a base texture of wood for another artist to use to project onto an asset in Mari. Easy task under normal circumstances. You know, a bit of clone stamping in Photoshop, job done. 
But because of what it all represented to me in that moment, my first and so far my only chance to prove my worth as a texture artist, the dreams it represented, and also the fact that it was late in the day, my energy was spent and I was no longer on my A-game, so to speak. Well, my reaction was a full-blown panic attack. I had to spend a considerable amount of time with the best self-talk routines I knew, as well as box breathing and whatnot to get my heart rate down to where I could start doing the work. At my next gig at Framestore, I was still a very much junior artist. I was assigned an asset that literally broke me. I still shudder when I think of Lab Bay Wall. That was a complex environment asset on Jupiter Ascending. That asset ended my career prematurely at Framestore. Well, there were other factors that played into that. But in any case, I'm sure you can imagine that as that disastrous outcome became more and more likely and visible to me, I spent larger and larger amounts of my mental capacity simply trying to keep panic at bay, which of course left less and less brain power for the actual work. That's what I call the death spiral. In aviation, a death spiral is when a plane reaches a state where it's out of control and every further action you take to try and bring it back to a safe level of steering will just make things worse still and hasten the eventual catastrophe. It is a situation you cannot recover from and it just exponentially grows out of control. I've since learned a number of techniques that I use today which helps you push panic back into the single digits so that you have the majority of your brain available for the work. Maybe a topic to cover in a future episode. Remind me to tell you about lists and Rembrandt. Anyway, that's why I'm so curious as to how other artists handle this. First of all, when this happens, don't panic. I mean, that's very obvious, uh, but the more it happens, because it will keep happening, it doesn't matter which level you are, it will keep happening. Uh, you just know that this moment, it's, you can overcome this moment. It's not that you will be stuck forever and ever. You just have to try to, uh, I mean, this is, I think, something that everyone says. It's like, if you get stuck on something, just get away from the computer, do something else, and then get back to it and try it again. And if you've been trying something for... But, but Claudia, you cannot. You oh, you have go to away because from the computer because you have tick tick yes. tick tick the clock that's but ticking down. So daily's coming like a freight train <laughs> speeding towards you. You know, so there is no time. There is no time to step away from yes, the computer. Yes, but I mean, statistically, at least my statistics, it's that okay. I might be sitting in front of the computer. I have a review with the supervisor, and then I have to come up with some ideas. Especially when you have to come up with something, you know, that it's ideas or R and D, whatever. I am stuck. So what my time getting stuck in front of the computer, if I am stuck after maybe half an hour that I'm trying something and I don't go anywhere, I know that if I keep pushing in that direction, I would lose another half an hour, one hour, and I won't go anywhere anyway. So am I losing more time by standing up, getting away half an hour, or just changing something uh, and then get back? or just getting stuck in my head and try to repeat the thing over and over to make them work. So, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So you have quite a logical approach to sort of getting yourself unstuck. Yes, there. yes, I, I do. Uh, I mean, it's like, it doesn't work ev all the time. I just know that sooner or later things will get unstuck. I, I mean, you know, it's like, for me, I always have this kind of, split things between being a very logical person and a very instinct, uh, instinctive person. And somehow when this thing two, these two things combine, I think it's, that's when things click for me. That's for me, of course. So it's like I trust my instinct that this thing will, I will get unstuck. And in the meanwhile, I will use the logic or the way I gained with the experience of how to get out of the situation 
to help things getting unstuck. But it's all really like a balance of, okay, I know this thing is not going anywhere. I need to trust my instinct that somehow things will, they will progress, but it's a process. It's really difficult to explain. Have you gotten better with this over the years, would you say? Or is it is still it's the same story? Yeah, of course. So it's like a muscle you train yes. and you get better and better I mean, with it's it. Not that, it's not that you get better at not getting stuck. For some things, yes, especially for like if it's a, it's a matter of technical stuff that you don't know. Of course, you gain more knowledge with experience. But if you have the artist block, you know, in a way, this can doesn't matter how much experience you have, it can happen. Eh? So maybe with the years, it, it's not that this improved, but in, it improved my, my understanding of this situation. So what, what's your biggest challenge right now? Are you, are you still struggling with what you would say, technically artistical ta- challenges, or has it more changed into that you, the challenges right now is around leadership and, and that role that you have? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the challenges, they can come from multiple parts. From a leadership point of view, of course, the, the challenge is really to always keep the right balance between the people, uh, with the team, uh, dealing with production, uh, with, you know, I, I serve as a kind of a filter between what happens between production and between my team. And that's always like the challenge to try to balance this thing, try to make everybody happy in a way that uh, there are no issues that are hitting the artists that are not supposed to, uh, that are not supposed to be. So that that's always the, the, the challenge or, you know, try to have everything work in a way that my work is also making other people work easier. On the other end, as an artist, it's like, you know, the, it's the usual uh, challenges of, okay, I need to do this and then you need to do it. Time is a challenge for me, so you need to do it on time and you need to do it good. Uh, so that's uh, running against time. It's the biggest challenge that I usually have. You see yourself as a, as a lead or a supervisor. You see yourself as a, what should we say, a force multiplier, something that can multiply the force of your team. Like, what can I do to make my team better, stronger, happier, faster, whatever it may be? Yeah, I mean, I truly, truly believe that, you know, happy team, an happy team makes a better work. And uh, so, and, and that's how it should be. Uh, I mean, I feel responsible for, for my team. And I think that that's how things should work in a way that um, I need to, it's part of my job, it's to create the conditions for them to work peacefully and to work as much as possible without stress. Because that's, uh, I mean, the happiness of people that I work with, I want people to be happy. I want people to be happy to work with me to work in the department uh, because then we can all thrive in that and we can all make better things. What, what have you found? What have you found? What are the critical things that really have a big effect on either, either for negative or positive um, on your team's morale, happiness, the efficiency, all, all of these kind of things? I mean, I think one of the uh, biggest things that uh, it's really bad for the team is lack of communication. So yeah, okay, I, I I can see that. Yeah, absolutely. Go on. Yeah, this is really important because I also suffer this. I sometimes I suffer this when I have lack of communication from production, for example. This happens. I mean, it depends from which project you're working on, which producer you're dealing with. But lack of communication is the worst thing that can happen because even the the, the artist that maybe just started has the right to be informed, not on everything, because there are some levels of information that not everyone uh, needs to know or needs to be bothered by some of the information, uh, but they need to feel still part of the team, still feel part of, okay, we are, we are a team, we are progressing together, we are doing these things together, this is what is happening, this is what we will be doing, uh, how is it going with your day? So it's like communication is super important. And now that we are also mostly working remotely, uh, at the beginning, uh, I mean, that was a general problem, a lot of people felt lost because maybe you were sitting in front of the computer and no one was writing you, no one was asking you, uh, 
uh, how is it going with your task or, you know, maybe you, you are out of task and you are a junior that doesn't want to say, okay, look, I, I don't have anything else to do and you just sit there the whole day and no one talks to you. Um, so this is really sad. It is. It's, a, it's, it's sort of like a, the crushing message of you're not important. Exactly. You know, and that's not, that's, yes, that, that's exactly it. We, I mean, since the pandemic, my goodness, it feels like such a long time ago. I'm thinking of, I've come across one lead and she was working really hard to sort of foster a sense of community and, and, and that we're all sort of like belong together and we're important to the team and all of this. It's not something that you come across a lot, unfortunately. It's, uh, it seems that most this this is this is rare unfortunately i think that people do actually think about what can i do to make my team feel better more like as a as a, you know like a happy community supportive uh, of each other and all of this it's and then you also not just think this but you you do specific things it's it's unfortunately rare i i can't help thinking how much better visual effects productions or any teams would be you know, if, if if people put a little bit more effort and, and emphasis on this. I totally agree. So so as an artist though, apart from, from these 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 sort of things that are more the management part of your job, do you have any challenges that you're working with right now? Do you have any do you have any any things that you're doing specifically to become a better artist on a on a day to day or month to month, or maybe you have some artistic goals where you're like you you'd like to see yourself in the future. I'd like to hit these targets for myself, whatever that may be. Yeah, I mean, of course, there is always space to improve, and uh, what I would like to uh, do is to keep doing more. Actually, I I would like to, on a practical uh, note, I would really love to do more and more organic stuff, um, more on a regular basis uh, because that's something that you know i did uh, the dragons uh, not all of them just one and uh, and now i see at it and already i have so many notes for myself and i said oh damn i want to do another dragon because i know i can do it so much better for so many things that uh, it's like it's always uh, it's a ma matter of moving forward and i also like to test and try things so you know it's like uh, okay, maybe this time I try with this different approach to do these things that uh, I, I don't like to be stuck on the way I do something and I do it always the same, unless I know it really works and uh, it's good for uh, the workflow and everything. Yeah, yeah. But I like to try new things and I like to... Um, I really get challenged uh, when I have a problem, like, you know, how do I approach this texture? How do I approach this creature or this asset? It's like, and and these are the, the time that then I start thinking and I like to test, do some R&D, see the results, try different things. And, uh, and this is what I really feel it always brings me forward because maybe in all of these things that I did, there is a part of it that I will keep it and then I will bring it to the next project. I will share it with the team. We will make it part of our way of doing things. I can share this with someone else to help someone else to make it better. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, this is something that I really like of, especially texturing, you have to do one thing, you have very many different ways to do that. And this is really, it really depends on, on the skills that you have, the skill set that you have. So. One thing, for example, that I really would like to to do more, I mean, that's not that I need to do it as a texture artist, but for instance, I love sculpting uh, and I would really love to do more sculpting just for the artistic sake of sculpt. Physical sculpting or sculpting in set brush or... Oh, I would love to do physical sculpting, but that would be on another... Okay. In okay. another life, probably, because yeah. I don't have time, but, you know, just getting the chance to to use zbrush to do some very nice thing that then i can texture so i do my own sculpt and then i texture this this never happens uh, uh in a in a in the daily work uh, um so this is all that part that uh, i know it could help me grow also artistically uh to do all of this part 
because then it's it's so related with texturing that it could be super nice for me to to do yeah absolutely i could see that have you ever had have you ever had an art an asset that just you just simply couldn't do you know for whatever reason like like if you're asking if you're asking a little baby a little child lift up this 100 pound weight no matter how motivated they are they just cannot do it have you ever have I, you ever hit a wall like that an asset that just that broke you that just or it you you just couldn't do it yes i mean uh most of the time i mean there are two different types of asset that i couldn't do like yeah. for example you know at the beginning it's like when they give you an asset that it's bigger than you yeah. in a way that they, they they trust you with okay yeah you can do this right you can do modeling texturing sculpting shading and uh, it's it's a hero asset and then you, you're there and uh, you realize okay i'm doing this asset but it's not looking good and i don't know how to make it better this happened of course uh, this happened to me and uh, somehow it worked, but they did <laughs> a huge amount of matte painting on top afterwards. <laughs> I, I hate when the, when the matte painters come in and paint over your work. It's the yeah. worst feeling. It's the worst yes. feeling. Yes. I, I, I feel every time matte painting is called in, it's a, it's a victory for them and it's a loss yeah. for me as an asset That's person. I, I, I totally agree. And so especially I was at the beginning and that really broke my heart because I thought, oh, okay, then my asset was really that bad. It was really bad, actually, I have to say. And then, I mean, later on, the asset where you hit the wall, it could be maybe on some projects that you don't enjoy that much or that you just, it's just... You've run out of steam or... Yes, any... you, you, you don't have any will to, you know, to do it. You do it at the end because you... There is no option to say, no, I don't do this asset. Uh, at least this never happened to me. It's like I, that's, you still do it. Uh, but there are some, some things that you are aware of the fact that, okay, this is, this is not going to work because I don't work well with this type of asset or, or whatever. So that's, uh, it can really depend. It's, it's different phases of the same problem, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So you have been for how many years with Pixamondo? It's it's gonna be. Oh yeah, I think almost ten years actually. Yeah, yeah. So even all these years at Pixamondo, ten years in one place. My goodness, I, I can't imagine what that's like. Well, when I was at I, at ILM, I had a lead. He had been at with ILM for twenty nine years, and there was the only studio he's ever worked for. I've worked for every studio in the world. He's only ever known that one place that one pipeline that's one th way of doing things everything else foreign to him but when you've been for i i try to imagine when you've been for 10 years or, or thereabouts in in one studio you were just describing something before that because what we do is project based so we follow a film or a tv show or whatever it may be from the beginning to the end and in the beginning of, uh, of the show maybe there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of energy and all of this and towards the end you're just sick of it it just it just <laughs> needs to finish you know do you still have that sort of up and down up and down of energy and motivation and so on and patience with with a show or has it just because you've been for so long in the same place they just become a regular job you turn up in the morning and you go home at night and it's a very steady output like that oh no i mean you have the up and downs of okay. course it's like uh you when you start a new project it's like all oh my god this is so cool and then at the end of the project you are just drained sometimes so yeah no of course every project is different uh, so yeah i mean i've been very long in the in the company um so of course i mean I have to say in 10 years, the pipeline and workflows changed like crazy. Uh, so, I mean, of course, I, I, um, I cannot compare to changing companies, but there was a lot of changing this. Like you never, I never got bored in 10 years. It's like, uh, uh, th that's for sure. And for projects, yeah, I mean, you have this super hype at the beginning and then you have to keep up because you cannot, uh, you cannot allow yourself to, you know, get sloppy towards the end, especially if you have to lead a department and you have to be the example for the artist uh, that they don't have to get sloppy at the end. So yeah, definitely. 
that must be hard that that's that's really when you show what level of professional person you are you know like uh, by the, the lowest levels of your ability the lowest level of your motivation quality and so on and so forth the higher they are of course i think the better professional you are do you have anything to keep that in check other than just sort of I don't know, maybe guilt guilt trips for yourself as in, no, 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 the team can't see me dip here. They can't see me uh, lose courage. They can't. Do you have any, do you have any, I don't know, any procedures or any habits or any anything that sort of helps you keep a steady output? Yeah, I mean, I mean with the remote work, uh, it's easier because they don't see you like eight hours straight in the face. So if I scream in front of the computer, no one hears me. So this is really good. And uh, if I know that, uh, you know, I, I like that. That's like the old alien thing in space. No one can hear you scream in, in the pandemic in, lo- in remote work. <laughs> nobody can hear you scream. That's very good. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, if I have if I'm scheduling a meeting with with the artist and I know now it's not a good time, I can always with remote, I can always schedule it for the next day. And, uh, you know, I, then I can you know, put myself together or anything. I mean, I never get so in this extreme way that, uh, oh my God, it's like I am a mess and I don't want my team see me like that. I usually never uh, get to that point. If there are issues or anything, I always try to share uh, as what I can share with the team with a smile and, uh, you know, just make it as a joke, you know, just, just let's say, let's laugh about it together, you know. That's, uh, that, that's how I do it. So then... Myself, I will start laughing about it also. Yeah, it's good to have, be able to have that sort of humorous distance to to your problems, including yourself, that's for sure. Yeah. When you when you look out there in the wide visual effects work, do you have any, any pieces of work out there that inspires you? Something where you're looking at other people's work and you think, oh my goodness, I wish I had done that asset. Why couldn't that have been me? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, there are many, many uh, things. One of the latest thing uh, that it really impressed me it was on the uh, second season of The Mandalorian. Oh, yeah. uh, and that impressed me even more because we worked on the first season. So it's like, you know, you I, I, potentially I got so close to do that thing. And it was that send the creature coming out of the sand in one of the first episodes. It, it's, it was like a kind of sand snake uh, huge creature and it was beautiful i loved that he was so nice it's like i think the whole way the sand was interacting with the creature the texture it was super super nice and i mean this is just one of the latest thing that uh, really uh, it's not it's not that recent anymore actually sometimes it's passed but that was really stuck in my mind like oh this would have been so nice to to do that uh, so is that that's what takes your what takes your fancy the sort of the cre- one creatures two sort of mythological creatures yeah okay i mean whatever i what i i of course i mean we work in vfx so we the, our work is based on uh, realism yeah okay and that's that's so cool i mean honestly uh i wanted to work in video games uh, my first idea was okay i want to work in video games because video games they create completely from scratch imaginary world yeah so it's like you are completely pure magic pure magic then i got to work in vfx because well vfx i mean now it's changing but vfx uh has more detail as more you you take care more of even if it's something uh fantasy you you take more of the detail you have more power you have more um room to work on something that uh you don't have to think about okay I cannot do 200 UDIMs for a creature because my engine will break because it's real time for a game. Uh, so that's why, that's what I loved about with VFX. I mean, I mean, I could put so much detail in that, that I love that. On the other end, of course, you're not only doing fantastic creatures. So that's why it's like, it, it's a bit of a compromise. I mean, not even in games, you're always doing fantastic creature, but... Uh, what I love is that to create something that doesn't exist in reality. I think that's for all of us. That's, yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, absolutely. 
What uh, were there any games that that you growing up with or whatever that hold a special place in your heart where you sort of think like, oh my goodness, I wish I had done that or this is the kind of work I'd like to do. Yeah, I mean, I I am a huge video game player, uh, and I grew up with uh, graphic adventures because they were a big hype when I was growing up in the nineties. Um, so for me, all the mist saga i don't know if you know it oh of course uh, yeah yeah that yeah. i think I, i think this was the first time we saw pre-rendered 3d graphics yes. at a yes. really high level i mean it yes. sounds funny to say today but in those days it really was yes and for me it was like oh my god i was brought into like these imaginary words that's where i actually got i got to know like okay when i saw matte painting for me that was okay that's There could be a way to reproduce these environments, you know. Um, but so for me, that was the game that for me, quality wise was, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. They invented so many of these beautiful words that I would love to, that they would exist in real life. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's what one of the games that uh, artistically really, really inspired me. Yeah, that's true. I. Oh, I I also started out in games myself. That was my goal. I wanted to work in games, and I somehow ended up in visual effects, as it happens. Um, but yeah, there we are. There, uh, I've spent countless, countless hours playing video games, and it was literally when you see computer graphics on screen for the first time. That's when I realized this is really cool. This is basically like me sitting drawing at home but on a on a different level on steroids and you can interact <laughs> with it and it creates immediate experiences for people i just knew i want that i want to be a part of that that's just nothing else matters you know so they games yeah have a lot to um be grateful for that's for sure you were talking about before sort of about marrying the logical side of your brain with your more intuitive more emotional more instinctive side is that your superpower or do you have do you have some other what would you say claudia what is your superpower is well, one well, one thing that you are really good at that you find very easy that somehow other people around you are like how does she do that or they they just they just cannot they're not on your level on that oh well i mean it, it's I, it's not comfortable to talk. Okay, I I feel that I'm so good at this. Uh, no, no. But yeah, I think, okay, but I mean, this this is, I don't I, I don't know. Like I I think I think this. I, I, hopefully, I I'm encouraging you to to talk about it. Like for myself, I see patterns. I see connections in everything. Other people just see like data that has nothing to do with each other. And I see no no. Don't you see these things are related to each other? They, I see patterns in everything. And that is something that helps me a lot because I can create a node graph that is another pattern, basically. You know, I can, mm -hmm. it is that pattern thinking is something that I can apply to computer graphics quite easily and is very helpful in, in many respects. It's, it's not the only thing you need. And then the, all the other parts, I, maybe I struggle, sure. But at least I have that one thing that seems to come fairly simply to me. Yeah, I mean, What you said before, it's it's true, actually. I think I, I have this kind of balance between being a very logical person and also an instinct instinctive person that really helps me a lot because when I connect the two things, I make things work in a way that uh, uh, I combine both the worlds and, uh, and I try always to get the best of these two worlds. So, for example, it's like I think... I am a very organized person, uh, especially when I work. So I, I'm really, really keen on keeping things organized because I know that if I, if I am super organized, then when it comes to do the artistic work, uh, I can just concentrate on that and not thinking about, okay, the, I ever left a mess or it's, uh, then I am free to do the other thing. So this, this, the fact of being, of putting always some thoughts and making, I mean, you said you see pattern. I also make connections between things and uh, I, I plan ahead of things in a way that then I am free to then give more space to my instinctive part to take over and then do whatever I want to do. 
So, you know, it's, it's like this kind of balance that really, really helps me to, uh, to make things work for me. What about, what about the negative side of things? Do you have, what is your weakness? What, 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 do you, well, what do you always have to sort of compensate for? Something where you know there's just a gap in my competence here and I, I always need to watch out for this. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, well, one negative thing that's not about really a gap, but that's uh, then I, I tend to... I want to have control too much over things. Uh, even my own, it's not about other people, uh, but when I... When I tend to I have too much control, if something doesn't, you know, work as I expect, then that's where things might get difficult for me. Um, I mean, of course, I know how to overcome this, but that's uh, that's the side effect of of trying to, you know, of this my logical side of yeah. um, of things. And on the other end, is that when you is that when you need to step back and laugh at yourself a little bit and just because yes things aren't working exactly the way you want them that, to exactly and... I mean I learned a lot on that and uh, I learned to let go on on many things uh, and this really this really helps but it's not easy to to learn that I mean you you really have to push yourself to let go of some of things and decide on which things it's important to um, to stay and some others not. And on this reflects on the artistic part of the of the job in a way that you know um, sometimes you you need to I mean this happens you need to just switch off and switch on on another thing try to change things or try to really embrace something different because otherwise it won't be working uh, and uh, I mean this. People that uh, this thing comes naturally to them, they're very lucky, I would say, that just like leave what you've done uh, and start completely new or something. But of course, I mean, it's also here a matter of letting go and then starting over or starting again. So that could be also something that you need to think about it. I'm also jealous of those people that can just let things go and let just, you know, and just start something different and and it seems like they doesn't have an emotional baggage uh, you know that came from the previous thing but on the other hand i wonder that because you care so much and so deeply about what you're doing and that is when you get so frustrated and you can't let it go if you didn't have that sort of deep level of caring so much about something you probably wouldn't get to the same levels of quality neither because that, yes. the, like that, when you have that obsession with something where you want to control everything, the perfectionism, and that's that's also what helps push you to levels of quality where otherwise other people would just be like, ah, this is crazy, just lay, leave it alone, you know. But you want to just make it that one percent or half a percent better. I totally agree with you. I mean, I totally agree. The problem is that it's still. I mean, I agree because that's my nature. Uh, but then sometimes you have to do some a reality check and say, okay, now now you're going too far with that. Uh, I mean, it's like it it cannot you cannot make it perfect sometimes, or so maybe sometimes it's not. You need to decide when is the time to stop for, with something and when is the time to uh, keep going uh, because sometimes you keep going and you ruin your health literally with something that you get too crazy about it uh, yeah I, I when you say that you ruin your health other people might listen to this and think ah surely they're exaggerating no no this is this is literally to the point where you you forego sleep you uh, forego exercise friendships with people what have you i mean i'm thinking about some of the the most sort of like when i've been deep in that hole of refusing to let go of this asset or control and you're spending hundreds hundreds of hours over a very short period of time with little other than just some very basic eating and very basic sleeping and then everything else is and that's not a very healthy space to be in not mentally not physically for sure yeah when you're looking back over the course of your career have there been any sort of key moments or turning points where where you can say you know if that hadn't happened i was really lucky here or really unlucky here if that hadn't happened i definitely wouldn't have been where i am today 
Claudia Marvisi will be back in a future episode. Thanks for spending a little bit of your day with us. We have a tiny bit of housekeeping to do on the way out. If this episode has been helpful to you, why not share the podcast with your colleagues and friends? If you'd like to support the podcast, I'd appreciate if you bought me a coffee. You can do that on coffee. That is spelled ko-fi.com forward slash the naked texture artist, one word. If you have suggestions, comments, or questions, I'd love to hear them. Feel free to drop me a line on the naked artist at gmail.com. That is the naked artist written out in all one word at gmail.com. As I mentioned, having a busy day job in visual effects means my release schedule for this podcast can be a bit irregular. So if you don't want to miss out, subscribe to The Naked Texture Artist wherever you get your podcasts. Or follow the podcast on the socials, then you'll be alerted when the next episode drops. The music in this episode was Awake by Tycho, Nick Sifoni helped put the sound together, and everything else was done by me, your host, Mark Pierre Sondergaard. Speak to you soon.